We'll continue our notes on carbon chemistry, We're talking about this time about carbohydrates and lipids. Carbohydrates are the main fuel for living things. Okay, This includes sugars and polymers of sugars that make starches. Um, the, the carbohydrates are used not only for fuel but also for building material. There are a lot of structures that are made of carbohydrates. The simplest carbohydrates are called monosaccharides. Mono means one, saccharide means sugar. Okay, so these are single sugars, things like glucose, um, uh, glucose, fructose, um, deoxyribose, ribose, and so forth are, are monosaccharides. The macromolecules made from carbohydrates are called polysaccharides, that means many sugars, and disaccharides, that means two. Okay, so the, so the polysaccharides are going to be the ones we refer to mostly as starches. And then we have the, the, the uh, double sugars, the disaccharides, things like sucrose and maltose that are sweeter um, than the monosaccharides are. Monosaccharides generally have the molecular formula that is a multiple of CH2O. That's why they're called carbohydrates. Remember the carbo for carbon and the hydrate for, hy for water. Okay, hyd hydrate means water. So what we have here is carbon and water, and we have multiples of that molecule, basically. The monosaccharides are classified by the location of the carbonyl group. Remember, there's going to be a carbonyl group on the monosaccharide. The aldose sugars are going to have the carbonyl on the final carbon, and the ketose sugars are going to have the carbonyl on, the, on an interior carbon. And then they're also classified by the number of carbons in the carbon skeleton. So we're going to look at how the, what these look like. Okay, the aldoses have the carbonyl on the final carbon. The ketoses have the carbonyl on an interior one, and the OSE part is means that it is a monosaccharide or a disaccharide. Okay, so oftentimes we draw these as linear skeletons like this here, but when you put them in an aqueous solution, generally speaking, that linear structure forms a ring structure. So you'll see both linear forms and ring forms when we're talking about uh, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and so forth. Monosaccharides are the major fuel for cells, and they're also the raw material for building bigger molecules that are used for lots of different things. Um, this is uh, glu a form of glucose, and you'll see here the ring structure shows you the location of all the of all the uh, different functional groups that are attached there. Notice that the oxygen here is in that that carbonyl group is in the uh, is in the uh, not the carb yes the carbonyl is in is in this um, in the ring within the ring. Okay, here's a more simplified one showing you. Um, that it doesn't show every single molecule there. What you'll notice is in the ring structure, you've got an oxygen here in the ring structure, and we're going to go clockwise around to number the carbons. So one, two, three, four, five, and then the sixth one here <coughs> is attached outside the ring. That's generally the structure that we'll see on the, the carbohydrates. The oxygens in the ring will count clockwise around from the oxygen to number the carbons, and the last one is usually outside the ring. Disaccharides are formed when you have a dehydration reaction that joins two of those monosaccharides together. So here we show two glucoses, and we're removing a hydroxyl from one and the hydrogen from the hydroxyl on the other, and they're going to be joined together through the oxygen here, and this is called a glycosidic linkage. You need to know the term glycosidic linkage. That's really important in uh, carbon in um, carbohydrate chemistry. Okay, so two glucoses added together makes maltose. Here we have a dehydration reaction forming sucrose. This is your normal table sugar that you eat most of the time. So we have a glucose and a fructose that join together. Notice the fructose, if you looked at the molecular formula, the molecular formula for fructose is the same as glucose, but here we have the CH2OH on two different carbons in the fructose. This structure is a little bit different. This is a ketose sugar rather than an aldose sugar. So you have here, um, the carbons are going to be counted a little bit differently too, but again, same kind of dehydration reaction that's going to form that glycosidic linkage between those two molecules to make the sucrose disaccharide that you put on your Cheerios in the morning or in your glass of iced tea. Polysaccharides have a numerous roles depending on the polysaccharide and, and, and how it's put together. And so 
the structure and function of those polysaccharides are going to be determined by how, by number one, which sugar monomers you use, and number two, where those glycosidic linkages take place because that changes the whole structure of the molecule. There are storage polysaccharides. Okay, this is starch, and this is what you find in potatoes. Okay, um, this is made entirely of glucose monomers. And the starch is stored in the granules within the chloroplast and within other plastids within the plant cells. The simplest form of this is called amylose, and it is broken down by an enzyme in your mouth called amylase that you probably have heard of before. Glycogen is the name of the storage polysaccharide in animals, and then we just call the one in plants starch or amylose. And um, in humans and other vertebrate animals, the glycogen is normally stored in the liver and muscle cells. So when you look at liver cells and muscle cells, you usually see these big, big fat white granules that look like they could be fat, but they're really starch that are stored there. Here are some examples of the storage, of the storage polysaccharides. These are starch granules that you find in a, in a chloroplast in a plant cell, okay? And this is amylose, and you'll see that it's, it's just formed by that normal glycosidic linkage between, between the... Uh, the two glucose molecules. Um, this oftentimes is seen as kind of a helical structure. Sometimes it has some chains to it, like this. Glycogen, which is found in animal cells, okay, these are, shows the mitochondria in here, and you've got glycogen granules that are found. This is probably the liver um, or something like that, or maybe a muscle cell. Could be a muscle cell cut sideways. But anyway, I think it looks more like liver because of the, of the smooth ER that you find there. Um, but you'll see the glycogen here has lots of chains on the side, so the structure is a little bit different between glycogen and, and um, the amylose that's found from plant cells. We also have structural polysaccharides. And uh, one that we think about a lot, that we use a lot and talk, and talk about a lot, is cellulose. This is the component of the, t of the cell wall of plant cells, okay? It is also a polymer of glucose, but it's got a different kind of glycosidic linkage. And it's based on the two ring forms of glucose, the alpha ring and the beta ring, and we're going to look at both of those, okay? So here we have the alpha glucose, and you'll see in the alpha glucose that the hydroxyl group is in this position on the first carbon. And in the beta glucose, the hydroxyl group is in this position on the first carbon. The structural formula looks the same, but the ring structure can be a little bit different. It's like one twists over the other way when it forms in the solution. So in starch, what you have is a 1,4 linkage of alpha glucose monomers. Okay, so the hydroxyl groups are like this. And in cellulose, you have a 1,4 gly glycosidic linkage of beta glucose monomers. And what you have is alternating hydroxyl groups between the, between the, adjacent, um, between the adjacent glucose molecules. Notice also that the oxygen in the glycosidic linkage is changing its position slightly too. And the oxygen in the ring structure. So they kind of form basically ups two upside down instead of two right side up. They're every other one upside down. So it's a little bit different, and what that does is it creates some cross linkages that can occur between the chains. The polymers that have alkyl glucose in them are going to be helical, like we saw back over here in the amylose structure. And the polymers with beta glucose are going to be straight. And in those straight structures, the hydrogen atoms on one strand can bond with hydroxyl groups on the other strand. As you see here, if I put these side by side, then you can see that it, you can very easily see how you'd link together that way. Parallel cell, uh, cellulose molecules are grouped into these microfibrils, which can form very strong building materials for plants. So here we have our cellulose molecules that are formed by that, in that beta glucose monomer, like you see here. And then you see that there are uh, hydrogen bonds that can occur, attractions that can occur between the chains. And that kind of, they kind of twist up to form these long cellulose molecules that form these fibrils. And then they twist together to make microfibrils. And then if you look at the cell wall closely, you can see there are all these crisscrossing microfibrils that give it a very strong structure in the cell wall. So this is what's very strong. The, um, Enzymes that break down starch uh, differ whether it's going to be alpha linkages or beta linkages, okay? So in your digestive system, you are not able to break down those beta linkages in cellulose. 
and that's why the cellulose in your food passes through your digestive tract as what they call insoluble fiber. So when you're eating a lot of plant material, that will go through your system as fiber, rather, and it can't really be broken down. There are some microbes that have enzymes that can break down cellulose. And a lot of herbivores like cows or animals like termites have a symbiotic relationship with some of these microbes that allow them to utilize more of the nutritional value of the cellulose rather than what we uh, experience as as omnivores. We don't have the enzymes that will break that down. Our enzymes are... Um, designed to hydrolyze the alpha linkages rather than the beta ones. So we, again, we can't, we can't digest that, so it passes through your system. Another structural polysaccharide is chitin. And chitin is found in the exoskeleton of arthropods and also in the cell walls of fungi. Okay, And you can see that the structure of the chitin monomer is a little bit different. It's got this, um, a couple of other groups on here. Here's an amino group and a carbonyl group and a methyl group that are that are attached to one of the carbons in the in the six carbon chain. Chitin is um, is so it's a very good structural support for both ar uh, arthropods and for fungi. It's also used to make a strong surgical thread that can decompose after the wound heals. So if you've had any kind of surgery where they put sutures in that were dis the kind of dissolving sutures, very possibly they were made from chitin because it will decompose after the wound heals. Another group of uh, molecules that we talk about in these uh, biomolecules are lipids. Lipids are what we call hydrophobic molecules. They do not really form polymers. But the big important thing about lipids as a group is that they have little or no affinity for water. They're hydrophobic because, and here's this is an important statement, they consist mostly of hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons are just hydrogen and carbon, and they form nonpolar covalent bonds rather than polar ones. The, most, one, the ones that are most important to us are the fats, phospholipids, and steroids. Those are the ones that we're going to be most concerned with. Are there others as well? Yes, there are. These are the ones that we're going to worry most about in biology. All right, so fats are made from two types of smaller molecules, glycerol, which is a three-carbon alcohol with a hydroxyl group attached to each carbon, and fatty acids, which are carboxyl groups attached to a long carbon skeleton. So you've got car lots of carbon and hydrogen, very little oxygen, and a fatty acid. Fats don't mix with water because the water molecules form hydrogen bonds with each other, and that excludes the fats. They don't really have any place to make hydrogen bonds. Okay, so here you have a long carbon chain, lots of carbon and hydrogen. You've got your carboxyl group here that can undergo dehydration with the glycerol molecule to produce oxygen there, and so, uh, to produce, I'm sorry, produce water there. And so you have a position there for three fatty acid chains to attach to one glycerol, and that can produce a fat molecule. The linkage between the glycerol and the fatty acid is called an ester linkage. And the ester linkage um, if has here has the carbonyl group attached to a carbon that's also attached to another oxygen there. So that, that particular um, configuration forms an ester. And what we have here is something called a triglyceride. You might sometimes see the triacylglycerol, but most of the time it's called a triglyceride. And you probably have heard of triglycerides. Uh, if, you've had your, if you've had any uh, lipid uh, testing panel done and you're on your blood, they'll, they'll list how many uh, triglycerides or the percentage of triglycerides you have in your bloodstream. Fatty acids vary in length. That's by the number of carbons, and also in the number and locations of double bonds. Some have single bonds, some have double bonds. The saturated fatty acids have the maximum number of hydrogen atoms possible, and they have no double bonds. So when you look at something like this one, you'll see that there are no double bonds between carbons, and every available position on the carbon atom is attached to a hydrogen. So they're saturated with hydrogen. Unsaturated fatty acids have one or more double bonds. And what that means is they will have fewer hydrogens um, than the saturated ones. So here we have a saturated fat. Saturated fat has no double bonds between carbons. You see just those straight carbon chains. 
These are generally solids at room temperature like butter. They, they will um, stay to pack together real tightly. This is called steric acid, which is a saturated fatty acid. But they'll pack together real tightly, which is what allows them to be solids at room temperature. Unsaturated fats have at least one fatty acid with one or more double bonds. And what happens in the double bond here, instead of having a nice straight carbon chain, it has a kink in it or a bend in it. Okay, This is called a cis double bond, and it causes bending of the molecule. Because of this, when you pack a bunch of these molecules in together, they take up more space and they can't be as tightly as the saturated ones. And so since they can't be packed as tightly, they can't ever form, they don't form uh, a solid. They form a liquid at room temperature. So here we have butter, which is a saturated fat, and we have olive oil, which is unsaturated. Phospholipids are a second group of lipids that we need to be concerned with. In phospholipids, you have two fatty acids and a phosphate group that are attached to the glycerol. The fatty acid tails are hydrophobic, but the phosphate group forms a head of the molecule that is hydrophilic. Hydrophobic means resists water, doesn't mix with water. Hydrophilic likes water, does mix with water. This is an important component of the phospholipid. So here we have a phospholipid. We have our glycerol molecule here that's attached to a phosphate and a couple of other side chains. This one's called choline, okay? And then we've got our two fatty acids, our two fatty acid tails that are attached to the other carbons in the, uh, in the glycerol. So this is our structural formula. Here's a space filling model that shows you the different parts, the choline, the phosphate, the glycerol, and the fatty acids. And we'll use something like this to represent a phospholipid when we talk about phospholipids in uh, cell membranes. Okay, the hydrophilic head here likes water, is attracted to water, is somewhat polar because of the uh, because of the groups that you find on it, and the hydrophilic hydrophobic tails resist mixing with water. That's very important. When you put phospholipids in water, they self-assemble into a bilayer. That's a double layer, with the hydrophobic tails pointing toward the interior. Of the, of the bilayer and the, and the hydrophilic heads pointing out toward water. Okay, this is what results in the bilayer arrangement in cell membranes, which we'll talk more about in another week or so, another couple of weeks. Phospholipids are the major component of all cell membranes. There are other molecules in the cell membranes as well, but phospholipids are the major component of them. Here you'll see a uh, this is a uh, phospholipid bilayer in water. So the hydrophobic tails are toward the inside of the bilayer. The hydrophilic heads are toward the outside, toward the water. Uh, the third major group of lipids is the steroids. These are characterized by a carbon skeleton consisting of four fused rings. You see the fused rings here. An important component of membranes is cholesterol. Cholesterol is found in cell, animal cell membranes in particular. Um, and it is essential in the cell membranes of animals. However, in your bloodstream, high levels of this can contribute to cardiovascular disease, which we oftentimes see in people that eat a lot of animal, uh, especially like things like steak and other kind of fatty meats. Um, there are other kinds of steroids as well. We'll talk about some steroid hormones and things like that. But this is going to conclude the lesson about carbohydrates and lipids.